Okay, so um, next, our, our next speaker is Wendy Chung, who is a clinical and molecular geneticist who's currently Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine and Director of the Clinical Genetics Program at Columbia University. She's a very active researcher, directing research programs on a number of different diseases, including yes. obesity, breast cancer, pulmonary hypertension, birth defects, and autism. She's received numerous awards, including the American Academy of Pediatrics Young Investigator Award, the Medical Achievement Award from Bonet Olam, and a Career Development Award from Doris Duke Foundation. She's recognized as an outstanding teacher and mentor. Uh, she's received numerous awards for her teaching as well. She's a member of the Glenda Garvey Teaching Academy, and she received the Charles W. Bonfalk Award for Distinguished Contributions to Teaching, the American Medical Women's Associated Association Mentor Award, and the Columbia University Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching. She's a member of the National Advisory Council for the Human Genome Research Institute and the Genomics and Society Working Group as well. And she was the original plaintiff in the Supreme Court case that overturned the ability to patent genes. She's a fabulous speaker, and you're in for a real treat. Her topic for today is developments in genetics and genomics in neurology. Mike? Okay, so we're going to do a whirlwind tour, uh, bringing you up to speed starting where Jacinda had uh, left off. Um, and we're going to start with kind of a philosophical question about why a diagnosis matters, or maybe it doesn't. And for some people, that uh, could be one or the other. Um, and I'm going to try and bring you up to speed in terms of really what blows my mind uh, in terms of what we can now do in terms of diagnostic as well as predictive testing. Um, and as we do that predictive testing, we sometimes find things that we weren't looking for. And so we're going to spend a little time talking about that as well. So uh, you probably can't read this very well, but this type of cover comes out in the popular press, I don't know, every other month or so uh, in terms of things that are uh, coming out with, you know, the newest is genetics or personalized medicine or genomics. Uh, but what you may not be able to appreciate way up here is that this is from 1994. Um, and so this is actually, oops, okay. Um, and so this came out in 1994, and the point is that uh, we've really had a lot of hype uh, about this for quite a long time. And so understandably, the public has been somewhat concerned when we keep hyping this and keep hyping this and uh, whether or not we can really deliver. Um, and so one of the things that really I, I do want to make the point is, although a lot of it was hype in the past, it actually is becoming reality. Um, not everything. Uh, it's not like I can take your genome and now predict everything that's going to happen to you with great accuracy. But at least on the diagnostic side, we really are making incredible uh, improvements and, and headway in terms of being able to get to the diagnosis. Okay, we're just, we're going to try it this way. We'll just hold it. Is that okay? Okay, so as we do this, um, like I said, one of the philosophical things that I spend a lot of times asking patients about is, do you really want a diagnosis? And I think that actually uh, depends for the individual and the stage of the process they're in. Some people, you know, want to know this yesterday. Some people aren't ready to handle all this information quite up front. Um, but when people do decide they want a diagnosis, one of the things that can be frustrating, and this is especially true for patients that have rare disorders, is it can take a long time to get to that diagnosis. I now have patients I've been taking care of for the past 15 years. We've been on this diagnostic odyssey together for 15 years, and now is the first time when we're actually figuring out what they have. And as we do this, it can be very painful painful, uh, literally, in terms of procedures that patients have to go through, the enormous expense. We've had patients that go through easily fifty, dollars $100,000 in terms of trying to find out that diagnosis. And in the meantime, really losing time if there is actually a treatment specifically for this condition. And so, again, not everyone necessarily wants that answer, but if you do want that answer, uh, we have incredibly shortened down that time to be able to get to a diagnosis. And uh, one of the things I often say is uh, we have to get beyond the diagnosis. We have to get to the treatment and, and prevention in many cases. Um, the hope, and although it's not, I, again, I don't want to hype this more than it is, the hope is that having a diagnosis actually helps us in terms of what we do that, with that information, either just because you personally, as a patient or as a family, can use that information in your planning, uh, hopefully because because we can come up with a treatment or a cure, although that's very oftentimes not the case. Uh, but oftentimes we can quit searching and be able to zone in on things that may be helpful in terms of prognosis, uh, being able to 
put our energies in a place where they're well directed uh, and be able to, in some cases, prevent it from happening again within a family. And I say this mainly for families, uh, parents, for instance, who are thinking about having other children. Uh, the final thing I'll say, and this is really philosophical, but is very important for some individuals, is just having the question why answered to actually come to closure about why this happened, what this is, and why it happened, uh, can actually be incredibly impactful. And uh, I can tell you, just as someone who takes care of a lot of children, there are a lot of my, especially mothers, who seem to think that it was something that they did during the pregnancy or uh, before they realized they were pregnant, a glass of wine they had that caused their child's uh, developmental disability, and being able to actually come to closure on that it wasn't that and, and what it was can be quite helpful for them just in terms of coming to terms and going onward from this. What's interesting, though, uh, is that we are getting uh, interest. We are interested, at least, in getting beyond just diagnostic capabilities and being able to get to predictive abilities. And this is where it becomes much trickier. Uh, we've been doing this in the prenatal setting to a certain extent, and uh, this is where we get into some thin ice in some cases because we may not be able to predict as accurately as we would like to. Uh, at this point, the mutation databases, or quote unquote, mutation databases that we use, are actually filled with probably about 25 percent of the variants in there not truly being mutations. And so uh, by using that source of information, which may not be entirely curated or credible, uh, we start getting into trouble when we take individuals who are asymptomatic and trying to predict what they might become. Uh, this is especially important in something we actually spent a lot of time even this morning talking about. As we're even thinking about this with newborns, uh, literally doing potentially genome sequencing on a newborn where you have, they, they really don't have, if you will, a phenotype or they're just, you know, little babies that really haven't started demonstrating any symptoms of anything, you really need to be incredibly accurate about being able to make that predictive information, given all of uh, what comes with it if you're going to do that. So I, I just want to make um, the point as we're doing this that when we do know exactly what it is within a family, and you're going to hear some of the uh, conditions talked about today, when we know specifically what the condition is in the family, what a specific mutation is, we are sure we know what's going on. We are very accurate at predicting in those cases. What we're not so accurate, though, is like I said, when you're just taking a blank slate, when there's no particular family history to th make you think that there's something going on in that family, and trying to predict, uh, like I said, from your three billion base pairs what might happen in the future. The other thing that comes on with predictive testing, and it's especially what we get concerned about for, uh, for instance, for many of us here today, um, are that uh, when you have a diagnosis, we're not really adding baggage, if you will, in terms of discrimination uh, with having that underlying genetic etiology in many cases. You already have a diagnosis of whether it be Alzheimer's or breast cancer uh, or autism. That, that sort of, in terms of your diagnosis, uh, really is already with you, and to the extent that your insurance company shouldn't be discriminating against you for that reason, it shouldn't make a difference if we now add on a genetic sort of uh, subdivision for that. On the other hand, when we talk about healthy people that are clearly healthy and don't have any signs or symptoms of these conditions, now carrying that genetic predisposition in the future, many times which is not 100% predictive of if or when that will develop, now adds a lot of baggage in terms of thinking about psychologically dealing with that, concerns that people have about discrimination about that information in the future. And so I bring that distinction into play because, like I said, as we go from an era of diagnostic testing to predictive testing, the stakes change. Uh, so within this, one of the things that's very confusing for many people in the public is uh, the following. There are some conditions, and I've shown this sort of as a, a range in terms of how heritable or how genetic a condition is. There are some conditions that are genetic. And by that, I mean that there are single, powerful genes, what we call monogenic disorders, that are really the answer almost entirely about whether or not an individual will develop that condition. So as Jacinda was talking about, uh, some conditions like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, really, if you have that DMD mutation, you are going to develop Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. There are some shades of gray in terms of how severe it is, but you will develop that condition. On the other hand, there are things that are genetic. And what I mean by that is there are things that there certainly is a genetic contribution, but it's probably not one gene. It's probably not one genetic variant. It's probably a constellation of several different genes, even perhaps dozens of genes. And to a certain extent, your exposures over your lifetime that, it, that combined actually determine if and when and how severe the condition is you might develop. 
And so as we think about that, it's difficult for the public to be able to understand those differences because they hear about genes, genes for this, genes for that, and it's not always clear in their minds how accurate that genetic testing might be because either it's a gene for, you know, just one gene for that condition or potentially many genes that go together with that. And so we're going to spend a lot of time focusing today on the things that are really powerfully genetic simply because I have to be quite honest, we haven't figured out those multifactorial, multigenic sort of conditions, and you wouldn't want to hear me just pontificate needlessly. Um, so the area of this space that we are very good at uh, is a relatively small space, as I was alluding to, that we call Mendelian diseases, or single gene disorders. Uh, oftentimes, thankfully for us, they're relatively rare within the population over here, and they have what we call high penetrance. That is, the probability of actually developing the disease is very, very high if you have that genetic predisposition. So we understand this space very well. Increasingly, uh, we know of about 3,000 genes, uh, and these are single gene disorders highly penetrant disorders for human disease. Uh, we are very quickly on a day-by-day -day basis adding new genes for diseases within this space. Um, but that's actually not where a lot of disease burden is. So when we think about a lot of the things that have to do with, for instance, adult onset conditions, diabetes, obesity, asthma, many different types of cancer, uh, we're talking about a space which is more over here, which is the common variants that have relatively low penetrance. So things where it might be 10% of the population has a genetic variance within that but maybe that is only confers a risk of maybe 2% to actually develop the disease. And so it's really only the combination of having 5 or 10 or 15 of those together in the aggregate that might ultimately determine whether or not that individual goes on to develop those conditions. So we still, the bottom line is we have a long way to go. We're making headway uh, relatively quickly, but we still have a long way to go with that. One of the other things specifically within neurobehavioral psychiatric conditions that I don't think we appreciated for a while because we didn't have the tools to be able to see it was that many conditions are genetic, but they don't run in families. And so all the time I get patients that come in to see me and they say, Dr. Chung, it's lovely meeting you. I have no idea why I'm here because my, there is no you know, family history of autism in my family. There's just my one child. There's no way this could be genetic uh, because obviously there's no family history and our genes are good. Um, so on the other hand, uh, we now realize that for several conditions, especially several conditions that impact what we call reproductive fitness or the probability that an individual will live to be old enough to reproduce or will actually have children, uh, that probability d is actually uh, tells us something about the underlying genetics. And so you can think about it this way. Uh, if there were a condition... Excuse me, if there were a condition where uh, this were unfortunately fatal by the time someone were 20 years old, it's very unlikely that they would live to be able to pass those genes on to the next generation. And so the only, gene, the only way those mutations actually exist in the population is because they arise new with each generation. And so the thing that's uh, quite novel for some people to think about is that not all of our genetic mutations are inherited from our father or from our mother, but in fact there can be some burden of these de novo or brand new mutations. And those brand new mutations, I can tell you because we've looked at this, happen for any individual person with about 20 of these brand new genetic variations every time you or I have a child. Um, and so these happen all the time. They don't often cause disease because these particular genetic variations don't land in places that are critically important. But every once in a while, and that happens about one in a thousand times, they do land in some place that's critically important, and then you end up uh, with an individual who can have no family history of that condition but can yet be profoundly impacted by that going forward. So one of the things that we've come to realize is that all of us are wonderfully unique. And as we've now had the experience of sequencing our exomes, sequencing our genomes, we realize just how genetically unique we are. Uh, about, for between you and me, about one in 1,000 base pairs, we will be different. And that's not that we're any better or worse than another, it's just that we're different. Um, and as we're doing this, every time I sequence a new person, I find approximately uh, 1,500 genetic variants that are incredibly rare, that we don't see all the time. And and about a tenth of those, about 150, I have never, ever seen before. So we are still very, very much in this learning curve. And the challenge is when I see 150 of those new rare variants for any person, what do I make of them? How do I try and guess about what that means for that person, whether they're good, bad, ugly, or neutral? And so that's why I said that in terms of trying to predict, we're still very much in the infancy of trying to predict that because we do not have enough experience looking at literally hundreds of thousands of humans from the four corners of the world to be able to interpret all of that genetic variation, be it either uh, normal or being it disease-associated. 
As we're doing this, though, we are getting into some, or we have for a long time, been in this new technology of trying to use this information. Um, and as we think about some of the implications of what we're doing, uh, we have to obviously keep in mind uh, trying to do what's best for individual persons, but also trying to keep uh, in mind what's best for us in a larger societal point of view. So the wonderful opportunity we have, and I and others use this quite frequently, is a procedure called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So when we do find that parents, for instance, carry some of these very powerful genetic factors uh, that can clearly have a very, very profound influence on the next generation, uh, they have the option of basically being able to uh, make sure that they don't have to deal with the quite difficult decisions about abortion, but make sure that the next generation won't have to deal with this. So we can go through in vitro fertilization. Uh, we can, it's not quite as much fun as having a baby the natural way, but we can go through in vitro fertilization. Uh, we can take an egg from the mother, a sperm sample from the father, dim the lights in the laboratory, play some nice music, uh, and uh, get them together. Um, when we do that at the eight cell stage of the embryo, we can very, very carefully remove one of those cells and test them for whatever the genetic condition is in that particular family. And again, uh, the screening process is done at the point of the embryo, so we don't have to worry about a woman being in the very difficult situation of already being pregnant, uh, you know, and having to make a decision after um, being able to have prenatal testing of whether to terminate that pregnancy or not. Uh, she can essentially make that uh, decision for at least a time when most people don't consider that a life. Uh, and be able to, even if she wants to preserve that life, keep it in the freezer forever. Um, and so that affords now many couples uh, for many, many different uh, personal religious uh, belief systems to go on to have children, to be, to be empowered, to have the ability to have children without having to worry about what could be a devastating condition within those children. So it's offered us enormous, enormous opportunities. It still comes with some challenges, though. It's quite an expensive procedure uh, in New York City, oftentimes going for about $25,000 a cycle and certainly not successful uh, at the end of any one cycle that will take home a baby at the end of that. Um, and so there are issues that we think about from an ethical point of view in terms of accessibility to this technology, uh, trying to make decisions about what is sort of disease enough to be able to screen for this. Uh, people have constantly been concerned about this idea of uh, designer babies. Could you positively select for certain traits? I have to tell you we're not smart enough to really do that at this point. Uh, but all the time people do, actually the most common reason and people do IVF PGD is actually for gender selection uh, and not for one of those excellent conditions like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, uh, but for simply family balancing and family preferences. So uh, again, very powerful technology, but, but I think we have to be very careful about thinking how to use it. So we've gone into a new era, though, in terms of thinking about this with really being able to comprehensively develop technologies to look at our genome, uh, doing it all really in one, one fell swoop, or in some cases right now, two fell swoops. Um, and so we started out uh, by doing this, looking at our genetic information under the microscope, looking at our 46 different chromosomes in these stick figures. Uh, but folks like me, uh, I actually have to admit, I never bothered getting boarded inside of genetics because I just, my vision is not good enough to reproducibly see those 650 bands under the chromosome day after day. Um, so instead, we developed some new technologies to be able to more reliably, reproducibly, and cost-effectively get us the same information. And it's similar to this. Uh, if you were out in outer space looking back at the face of the Earth, you would be able to see big land masses like this, uh, like I can see a karyotype. It's approximately the same level of resolution. The problem is there's a lot that we're missing by just looking at it this order of scale. You want to be able to go on your computer like Google Earth and be able to zoom in and be able to get much higher resolution. You'd like to be able to go to the United States, you'd like to be able to go to New York, Manhattan, and you'd even like to be able to zoom in and be able to come to Columbia University. And essentially, we now have that level of resolution uh, by looking for these things that we call copy number variations uh, in our chromosomes. And I'm not going to, for today, go through all the technical detail, but we now have the ability to look at this and be able to look at essentially 2.5 million zip codes around the world and be able to see, is any of them missing? Is any of them extra? Have we lost or gained any of that genetic information as we're going forward? And simply to say this can now be done in a laboratory from a blood sample uh, and done for as little as approximately $750, very, very reproducibly. Uh, and again, I won't go through the detail, but I can tell you uh, that with an afternoon, uh, I would suspect that I could actually train most of you to be able to see things like this, which represent a deletion or missing piece of genetic information or an extra piece of genetic information like this. It really becomes very robust, very reproducible, and doesn't take years and years of training to be able to do this. So I'll give you just one 
example of how this can be helpful. Um, this was actually a patient of mine uh, who now uh, is doing very well, but uh, she has had a, a tough road at times. Um, she ended up, uh, during pregnancy, her mother had an amniocentesis because she happened to be the old, old age of 36. Uh, and when she did that, she was found to have what we call a new or a de novo balanced translocation between chromosomes uh, 11 and 22. Um, this meant that neither of her parents had this particular change, uh, and this was uh, something that, again, sh this was several years ago, and we didn't have the technology I just told you about. It looked under that microscope at that sort of high-level view like all the information was there. didn't look like anything was missing. It didn't look like anything was extra. And her mother had a normal ultrasound, and so she went on the advice of her obstetrician who said, there's about a 6% chance that something could happen in your child, but it's only 6%. Uh, you know, go ahead with the pregnancy. And she, she made the, that decision to do that. Unfortunately, after her baby was born, uh, we could actually obviously get a better view of the child, uh, not just by ultrasound, and she had some dysmorphic features. And unfortunately, the worst of it was that she had very, very severe infantile spasms, a difficult type of seizures to be able to control. And as she's grown up, we've realized that she's significantly delayed. She has an IQ of uh, 65 at this point. And so uh, when the technology became available to see whether or not this translocation was truly balanced, whether or not there was any extra or missing information, uh, we remarkably, we actually saw that there, in fact, was a big piece of information that was missing, but it was not at either of the translocation breakpoints of 11 or 22 involved in the original karyotype that we saw, but a big chunk of chromosome 20 that was missing. And again, this is obviously 2020 hindsight, but this information we're now actually using all the time prenatally to be able to give parents perspective of parents uh, even more at high resolution, more detailed information. Um, this is now what we consider a first line test as we do this uh, for children uh, in the pediatric era, either with things like birth defects, developmental disabilities, um, and it is also something that Ron Wapner has led these studies being able to do this in the prenatal setting. So being able to tell uh, when there's a fetus either that has an anatomical problem uh, or some other anomaly to be able to get parents the most information possible. And that's great. But that's even still very macroscopic information. That's at the level of looking at every single zip code. We want to be able to zoom in even more uh, in terms of higher resolution to every single nucleotide at some point. And this has really only been possible with the advent of the decreased cost of sequencing with some of the new technology we have in quote unquote next generation sequencing. Uh, as Illumina eventually gets broken with their monopoly and decreasing some of the reagent prices, this is actually going to fall off the cliff again in terms of the cost of sequencing. And it has been a tremendous enabler in terms of being able to move the field forward from looking at gene by gene to looking at now classes of genes and increasingly the entire genome. So as uh, Jacinda was pointing out, uh, we had the ability in the past to do a genetic test for something like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We've blown that out of the water now in terms of being able to do a genetic test that includes any type of neuropathy or any type of myopathy or any type of epilepsy. Uh, and so now what we've done is bundled all of these genes together to be able to, by clinical indication, look at potentially tens, hundreds of genes for any one of those indications. And we're limited only by the fact that we're still identifying many of those new genes for those indications. Epilepsy, just as an example, there are commonly uh, panels of genes that are now approximately 60 different genes for this. But in reality, and Ruth could say this even better than I, I'm sure we are well over 100 different genes for epilepsy at this point, um, although many of them certainly rare uh, when we look at the general population. And so we've tried to figure out a way where we could cost-effectively survey the entire genome. And so your genome is structured like this. Uh, it's something that if you look at late on a Friday afternoon like today, you're sort of cross-eyed and thinking, what in the world is she talking about? Uh, but as we highlight for you specific pieces of information here, you can now see the Gettysburg Address, uh, four score and seven years ago. Uh, but it's interspersed within that as a lot of gobbledygook, some information that doesn't quite make sense what it is or what we're to do with that. And that's the same way our genomes are set up. Uh, uh, we've got 3 billion uh, letters in terms of the information, but really it's only about 1.5% of the information that's encoded within these gold nuggets, which ultimately make the proteins uh, that at least at this point we know what they mean and what they do. And so we're taking a shortcut at this point. It's still rather expensive for us to sequence an entire genome, although I have to tell you the cost has come down tremendously just in, within the last year. And so we're focusing these days on about the 1.5% of the genome that we understand how to interpret, in part because it's cheaper. Informatically, it's easier to deal with that amount of information. And importantly, it's because that's all we understand, to be quite honest at this point. 
All of those little bits, all of those gold nuggets are what we call exons. And so when we put that all together, we call it an exome. And as we do that, we can now be able to do this at a, pro a price that's approximately, in terms of the reagent cost, about $700 per person. So certainly much less expensive than it used to be. As we're doing this, we are using this clinically. And in fact, uh, we have a publication that just came out uh, with Alejandro, who you're going to meet later in genetics and medicine, showing on the front lines in real clinical practice how we use, utilize this now every day of the week as we do this. Uh, increasingly, we've done this for patients who are searching, obviously, for a diagnosis. Many of them, as I said, have been on that odyssey for many, many years. Uh, but as we've got these tools available, we're using this more and more as a frontline test to be able to get to a diagnosis very rapidly. And I can tell you that when we've needed to, to push comes to shove, we can even get this done within seven days. Uh, so we can do this potentially when we need to, to affect clinical management very quickly. Uh, the place where it ends up being very, very useful are for conditions where there are many, many different genes that can cause these conditions and where in many circumstances there are sort of nonspecific findings that go with this. And so uh, what we see oftentimes are individuals with developmental delays, intellectual disability, autism, uh, conditions where there are literally hundreds of genes that are involved. As uh, I and others have been involved in studies of birth defects, similarly, we know of that there are probably about 400 genes for congenital heart disease, about 200 genes for diaphragmatic hernia. And so for many conditions like that that are genetically quite complicated, it becomes very useful. In addition, we don't, there's sometimes where we know a, a common reason for referral to me is uh, this particular family history has two or three affected children. They all look like clones of each other. They look like they must have, uh, obviously, a condition running in the family. Wendy, I have no idea what it is, but figure it out. And so those types of families that we see where it looks like, and you can fill in the X, it could be hearing loss, it could excuse me, it could be seizures, it could be uh, dementia, but something where it looks like it very clearly is running in the family uh, reproducibly is amenable to this type of technology. And in certain parts of the world where there's intermarriage uh, or consanguinity, a very, very useful technology to be able to use to identify those types of conditions. However, what's interesting, and I blame myself for this, is some of us are doing this, and we're doing a little bit of research at the same time, to be quite honest, we're trying to provide clinical care. And so I'll point out a couple examples as we've done this, because uh, we are doing this in the service of trying to provide the best, very best, most cutting edge care to our patients, uh, but sometimes we find ourselves in interesting positions, in this thin ice that I referred to before. So as an example, I had one such patient uh, that I'd been following since the time he was born. He unfortunately was very significant significantly impaired, had microcephaly, was very, very developmentally delayed. He was one of my kids that's not a walkie or talkie um, in terms of his uh, impairments. Um, and his parents were very much interested in being able to have another child. Uh, and so we had gone through originally single gene testing, chromosome microarrays, and I didn't have an answer for them. And finally, as this new technology became available, we decided that we would go ahead and try this. Uh, and the bottom line was when we did one of these exome sequences, we compared the child to his mother and father and identified, in fact, that he had a de novo or a brand new genetic change in this gene called MYH10. Uh, for those of you who are genetic aficionados, you'll realize that this is a premature termination. It's not the type of thing that's usually a benign genetic finding. It's usually uh, pretty deleterious. But we had an N of one. We had one particular patient with this particular condition. There was no other human patient on the face of the earth who had ever been described with a mutation in this gene. And so we were left thinking that it's a pretty good candidate but can I be certain that, in fact, this is the underlying cause of his condition? Now, of course, in the process of doing this testing, because unfortunately the testing took several months, his mother calls me up and says, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. Oops, I wasn't trying, but I'm pregnant now. And the question became, what do I do with this information? I mean, I had told her the information. Full disclosure, I told her everything we knew, everything we knew about this gene. But now she's asking me, can you take this information that was done in a clinical laboratory, CLIA clinical laboratory, done perfectly as part of clinical care, but it's a little bit research because this is the only patient in the world that has this, and yet she wants to make a very, very important decision about whether or not potentially she might continue or terminate a pregnancy based on this. And so it was tough. So I went to, and obviously this is where we entered into research mode. Um, luckily, uh, in this particular case, I went out, we scoured the research community. There was a group uh, at the NIH who had actually made a mouse model of this. They had a mouse model that was an MYH10 knockout. 
Uh, I won't bother you with the details, but the punchline is the mouse looks exactly like my patient. For all practical purposes, the mouse recapitulated exactly what we saw in humans. That made me feel a lot better that we probably had the right gene at the time. But still, I had absolutely no other human patients with this, and the clock was ticking for me. I literally had only a few weeks in terms of the period where she could potentially terminate a pregnancy to be able to get her this answer. So I'm gonna put the question to you guys. What do I do in this situation? And I'm gonna give you two choices, right? Number one, I go ahead, I disclose, I, you know, I tell her everything I just told you, and I say, I'll go with you. I will partner with you on this. I can't be sure of what we're doing here, but I am at this point about 90% sure that this is the cause of your child's problem. If it's a de novo mutation, it's probably not going to happen again. But we will do the prenatal test, and at the same time, we will also use every other means we have to monitor your pregnancy, doing the very best high-resolution ultrasounds to look for any of these problems. And I'm not certain what I'm doing, but I'll offer this to you as, you know, sort of uh, going on this journey with you together. That's choice A. Choice B is CYA. Cover your behind, because this is, from a medical legal point of view, we don't know that this is, in fact, the child's cause of uh, the condition. And you, if you make a mistake within doing this, you have done a disservice to your patient, and you've also perhaps done a disservice to the community in terms of trying to push this too far too fast. So how many of you say choice A? You don't have to vote. And how many of you say choice B? Oh, boy, I feel so much better. <laughs> Okay, so I went with choice A. Um, obviously, I framed the question, so I may have influenced your, your voting, but I went with choice A, and I'll tell you the long story short. Uh, the, the good news is, number one, we did not find the mutation in the fetus. Uh, number two, the, by ultrasound, we saw absolutely none of the problems that we had seen uh, in, in her son. Um, and the baby, I can tell you, was born and is completely healthy. So it was a happy ending to that story. We have since, since had time to go home and do our homework, and we've actually screened other humans for this disorder. And we have now, although we didn't at the time, brought this up to an N of three. So I now know that there actually are other humans in the world who have exactly this condition. In hindsight, I'm, I was right and in the sense that this really was the pathogenic gene for this patient. But at the time, I really truly did not know as we were doing this. We were making up the rules as we went along. Um, so I'll give you one more example when we did this, but how I got into even uh, more interesting waters as we did this. Uh, this was a very lovely uh, lawyer patient of mine, um, and that always makes me be extra careful. Um, but uh, she had a condition that she had had since the time she was literally a youngster. She had these growths all over her body. She had some on her face, some on her neck, some on her back. Uh, and she used to go to Sloan Kettering every six months to be monitored for these things. Thankfully, none of them ever became malignant or metastasized, but she had several of these. Uh, she was at the point in her life where she was thinking about having children, and she came to me saying, I don't know what these are, but help me figure this out and whether or not this is something genetically transmissible to my child, my future child. We took a very careful family history. We didn't see anyone else who had similar types of growths, although we did see a little bit of cancer within the family, some breast cancer, some ovarian cancer, but nothing that looked quite like this. So at the time, I had a panel of single genes that I could test her for, and I tested her for a panel of single genes uh, that I thought might be the underlying cause, but I didn't have great hopes that it certainly was because this was a little different than any of these other things like neurofibromatosis or hereditary leiomyosis. Um, but we did them anyway, and not surprisingly, we came up with a whole bunch of nothing. Thing, um, because it wasn't, uh, in fact, the right answer. She went on, and she had a son. Lovely, lovely baby. And unfortunately, I got the panicked call from her that her son was starting to demonstrate the same things that she did. He was starting to have the same gross. Uh, and so we got a pediatric surgeon to remove one of these that was in a particularly bad location. And the good news was that when we did that, we finally got the right pathological diagnoses on these. We uh, got a very good uh, pediatric pathologist to tell us that these were infantile myofibromas. Uh, and that really was incredibly important to push this forward. Um, I now became quite concerned because now we did have a family history. We had the mom, we had her son. Uh, and I was quite concerned about this, as was she, because we didn't know for either of them what the future was going to hold in terms of malignancies for these. Um, so we got uh, working on this, uh, and we did one of these exome sequencing experiments. And to make a very long story short, uh, we identified that, in fact, uh, she has a de novo mutation in a gene called platelet-derived growth factor receptor beta. And she, again, was an N of 1. As we did this experiment, she was the first person in the world identified with this particular gene's mutation. Uh, and I didn't, in fact, know if I was right at this time. I had some really good positive information. I knew that she carried the mutation. I knew her son carried the mutation. I knew that her mom did not marry, carry the mutation. At the time, uh, her father was deceased and not readily accessible to be able to get a sample uh, to be able to test him. 
Um, I do oftentimes, as some of you in the audience know, dumpster diving. Um, so I will actually go and retrieve specimens from all sorts of interesting, unusual places. And from her father's old razor, uh, we were able to actually get enough of a DNA sample to test for this one particular spot and demonstrate that it, in fact, was a de novo mutation. So it was a new mutation in her. That explained why we didn't have a family history of this particular condition. Um, one of the things that's incredibly powerful and is important as we think about things like the Global Alliance and a sharing of genomic information, and one of the reasons I bring up this scenario is that um, we had an N of one, and I needed to be able to increase that to be certain that this was the cause with an N of two or three or four. So I reached out to some of my colleagues internationally, and uh, I got, uh, this is a very rare disease, I have to tell you, uh, was able to find one of my colleagues who'd seen a family like this. She happens to be in Canada. Uh, and so she offered and happened to have done exome sequencing in this case. And so I asked her, could she simply query her data uh, and see if she, in fact, had the same gene this, uh, that I had? And she was kind enough, uh, although I didn't necessarily know it at the time, uh, to be able to do a query for me overnight that included not only her database, but in Canada, all of the genomic information is, in fact, in one repository in Genome Canada. So, in fact, all of the investigators across Canada have all of their data located centrally, um, and they're able to query that with the way that they've set up their data sharing. And so she wrote me back that night, and I remember coming in and seeing the email first thing in the morning. Not only did we have an N of two, but as she queried that database, we actually had three additional families, the same exact disease, the same exact gene, the same exact mutation. And so it became very, very clear, literally overnight, simply by data sharing in a way that patients consented to that we could drive the field forward incredibly quickly uh, for all of these patients. And I say this again because I do think we need to think about ways that we can share data still protect patient privacy and all their concerns, but be able to do what's best for them, which is to move this field forward as fast as we can. Where I got into trouble, or not necessarily trouble, but where it actually started making us think about this, uh, and it spawned a whole new complicated area, as some of you know, uh, we were looking at her sequence, and in fact, as we looked at her sequence, and looking specifically for tumor suppressor genes, genes that cause cancer, I could not help but see that, in fact, this woman also carried a BRCA2 mutation. So one of these breast cancer genes uh, that certainly was not the cause of her infantile myofibromas, but certainly was something she had, certainly something I could see that she'd passed on to her son. And as I went back and looked at her family, was consistent with some of the breast and ovarian cancer that we saw within the family. And so then the question became, when I had her sign that original consent form, I had a little checkoff box that said, if I find the underlying cause of the reason you came into the study, do you want me to return that information? And she, like almost all my other participants, checked off that box. <coughs> However, when I originally set up this consent, and this is now four, different, four years ago that we did this, I had not had the foresight to ask her, if I happen to find anything else that would be useful to you, should I give you the, back that information? We had not, as a community, not had even thought about that as being a possibility. And so now I have this conundrum. What do I do? I had not originally asked her, does she want to know this information? Should I give it to her? But on the other hand, this is a particular genetic mutation which can confer up to a 50% risk that she'll develop breast cancer, a 20% risk that she'll develop ovarian cancer, and something that there's something she can do about. She doesn't necessarily just have to get these cancers and die of them. We can either do prophylactic surgeries, we can do intensive screening for this, she can be Angelina Jolie and follow in her footsteps, uh, but there is something that can be done with that information. So I'll ask you again. I'll give you two choices. What should I do with this information? Number one, in some way, I offer to give her back this information, and she can say yay or nay. Or option two, I hear no evil, I see no evil, I speak no evil, I just pretend that I never saw this in the first place. So how many people say choice A? Somehow you got to get this back to her. And how many people say choice B? Just pretend you never saw it. Okay, we have unanimous group here, this is great. Okay, so again, whew, sigh of relief, I did the right thing. Um, so in fact, uh, I think as we have surveyed uh, the, the public, both the public as well as uh, many professionals, research professionals, uh, uh, medical professionals, we've come to the same kind of consensus. I wouldn't say it's 100% in the voting, uh, but it's come to this type of issue, um, which is that as we think about running into these things, uh, incidentally, uh, in the process of doing something else, uh, that these types of findings, these secondary findings, these incidental findings, are something that could be incredibly important. And I won't uh, summarize the incredibly rich debate that we've had in the community about this, uh, but to simply say that our group, uh, I think, has been sort of kind of, I think, very reasonable about thinking of this in sort of middle of the road, uh, and definitely, uh, again, long story short, there's been incredible 
uh, change in a good way about, I think, coming to the right answer or, or what's the most reasonable answer in returning this. And the bottom line is that um, we do think about, at least when we do this from a clinical point of view, we now have a list of 56 genes that are actionable that we do offer patients the, re the option of return of that information. We don't require it, but we offer them the option. So as we've been doing this, uh, again, a tremendous new technology in terms of doing this, but it's very interesting that we're getting into this space where it's clearly clinical care, but we're also getting into, because it's such a new technology, and because we've pushed it out into clinical care so early uh, that we're still in the process really of gene discovery and being able to do science or doing science at the same time that we're pro providing clinical care. Um, as we're doing this, it's uh, uh, very doing very well. It's still not perfect. I would say that in our sensitivity of this uh, when it in cases where it should be 100% is still only about 50%, so we still have room to do better. And I think that's going to come uh, at the point in terms of genome sequencing beyond just this exome sequencing. So the newest challenges that we're going to have as we're doing this uh, are that, number one, to be able to sustain what we're doing, we're going to have to convince people that this is a good idea. And by that, I mean that it actually improves care, that it's cost effective, it's good for patient outcome. Uh, so we have a lot to do in terms of, as a healthcare system, being able to show and demonstrate that this is a good idea. Uh, we need to do this faster. At this point, we're doing a turnaround time for this in about four to five months. And at some point, we really need to be able to do this in certain cases, at least in more like four to five days. Um, the wonderful thing is, uh, uh, as Ruth had alluded to, by getting rid of the barrier of gene patents, we now can do this in a comprehensive genome-wide way. Uh, we don't have barriers for the 20% of our genes that are patented, and so that's been tremendously uh, powerful. But way beyond this, we need to get beyond the diagnosis, and we need to get to treatment. And with some of the new technologies with gene editing, I don't think it's going to work 100% of the time, but hopefully we're going to have much more to offer patients as we're going forward. So I'll be glad to stop here and take any questions now or later. I'll be Jacinda. Uh, there's been a paper that um, suggests that uh, in autistic infants, you can actually, that there may be changes in the brain in utero. Mm -hmm. Could you envision a time when we would actually be imaging brains of infants in utero and what would be some of the ethical issues that would come up? Right, so we actually do do this already. Um, so we do ultrasounds and we can at least see the grossest abnormalities in utero for, for children. So we can see things like agenesis of the corpus callosum. We can see certain types of Dandy Walker malformations, other types of gross brain abnormalities. So we already are doing this. Um, the things that we're seeing, though, I would say are very clearly pathological. Um, it's not something that's sort of subtle when you're not sure of what the outcome will be. When we see these things, it's usually not a good sign uh, in terms of doing that. Um, and so the state we're in now is oftentimes seeing that but not necessarily having a specific diagnosis to give prognostic information to those future parents. And so the difficulty is, is that if you can think about it this way, there are huge confidence intervals around what the outcome of that baby is going to be. And it's the challenge, I think, in terms of as we do prenatal care, being able to give as much information as we can, but still dealing with a lot of uncertainty and what parents have to think about with that. Um, I personally am interested in uh, both the decisions that couples make in terms of continuing those pregnancies, but even more than that, if when they do continue and the baby's born, what is their perception of that child, uh, either because there's some anatomical marker, something else, a uh, genetic marker potentially, uh, what is their perception of what that child is, and is that an accurate perception, and does that influence at all the sort of parent-child bonding and the relationship and the dynamics within that family. Um, so I think the challenge is going to be that more and more we are going to find out even less clear information. So let me just give you an example that uh, with this chromosome microarray technology that I alluded to, we uh, are routinely doing that or at least offering that in the prenatal setting. Uh, we now see copy number variants, for instance, that the main effect is something like an IQ difference of about 10 points. I can very reliably and confidently tell you that it should have an effect, and it's going to be an IQ uh, of approximately 10 points points, but that's not anything as devastating as something like 30 or 50 points, right? And so I think the greater and greater challenge for couples is going to be is what do I do with that information? If that child's IQ was going to be 120 anyway, and they're now down to 110, they're still way above average. I mean, they're still, you know, likely to have a good outcome, if you will. 
um, but is that good enough? Um, and so I think those are the areas we're already in right now, and we're going to be even, you know, we're going to be just diluted with as we find out more and more of these, these types of genomic results. Are insurance companies covering exome sequencing? Yep. It's a very good question. Um, so uh, in certain cases, so in the very early days when we do, were doing this, and I don't think they knew what we were doing, there was pretty much complete coverage. Uh, 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 then they then they got word, you know, of what we were doing, and I think they started seeing the bills coming in, and then they started saying, "Hmm, I'm not so sure. Can I can I deny this?" <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we certainly routinely get denials for things like this. Um, you know, we're used to dealing with uh, trying to justify what we do, so oftentimes we come up with the reasoning why a diagnosis matters, uh, how much it'll cost as another alternative method of getting a diagnosis, both opportunity costs as well as financial costs, uh, and we make that argument as well as we can. But you're certainly right that it is not universally covered. Um, and I'm sorry to say that especially if you have Medicare, uh, you know, good luck, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, and Medicaid in many cases is more challenging as well. So it's not equally accessible to all members of society, which I think is, is problematic personally. But. Okay, we'll go on.